Hey gang, what is a crack -a lackin Do not pretend that you're not excited because today we are moving on to my favorite and your favorite, the progressive era. And you're going to be asking yourself, Mr. Gillespie, what is the progressive era? How can I understand this? Well, I want you to think about the Gilded Age starting roughly after the Civil War about 1870. Uh, the progressive era as a response to the Gilded Age. So it's not like the Gilded Age ends and then somebody comes outside and says, now let's begin the progressive era. They are roughly the same time period, but they have different emphases. So I want you to think about the progressives as this and the progressive era as a period of social activism and political reform in the United States that flourished from the 1890s, and that's a very relative date, that's a very uh, tentative date. Um, some historians will say before, some historians are gonna say after, but I'm gonna go ahead and say as a ballpark figure, 1890s until the end of World War I, and historians will generally agree that the progressive era ends with World War I, and we will talk about why. We keep on going, I want you to think of the Progressive Era as a series of responses to the problems associated with rapid industrialization, immigration, and urbanization, the three things that are happening in this post-Civil War era. So the Progressive Era is a response to those. It's not a one-sided issue, it's not a one-sided response, it's made many different responses, it's a spectrum of responses. And also I want you to think of the progressives, the people who participated in this progressive movement and progressive movements, were a coalition of reformers. They're not a single group who sought to employ the power of government. And that is government at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And they want to use the arm of government to engineer what they believe to be a better society. So think of progressivism as an umbrella, encompassing a whole lot of different folks with a whole lot of different agendas. You have people such as suffragettes, that is women who would like to obtain the vote. There's also prohibitionists, people who want to uh, limit or ban alcohol. You also have conservationists, what we would think of, not as a, not what we would think of as environmentalists today, but conservationists, people who want to protect the natural environment. Then there's also socialists, people who would like the government or the public to own the means of industrial production. There's also Christians, and I know you're surprised to think that both socialists and Christians are going to occupy the same category, but in this sense, before the Cold War, they do. There are Christians who will consider themselves to be progressives. And yes, there's W.E.B. Du Bois down there. There's even civil rights leaders who count among progressives. And you're thinking, this is a really disparate group of people. What could they all possibly have in common? There is one thing that unites progressives, and that's the belief that society can be engineered, that society can be created, that people can take a hand in, in reforming society through reform legislation and enlightened government. So we're going to start with the first part. I'm calling it In God We Trusted, In Kansas We Busted, and that's sort of the prelude, the tremors that you hear before the full onslaught of the progressive movement, and that is called populism. So begin with the farming movement. We remember our Go West uh, movie in which we learned that a lot of people moved out west under the Homestead Act of 1862, and their dream was to own land and farm and eventually get rich. But the problems that they run into are with the railroad companies, the railroad tycoons, which during the Gilded Age are monopolizing the means by which they use to transport goods. And the farmer doesn't have any say in what the railroad tycoons are gonna charge for the long haul or the short haul. And so as a consequence of all of this, the poor farmer is in debt 
First of all, he borrowed cash from the banks in order to start this farm, and now he's beholden to the railroad companies for transporting his crops to the to the cities, and they are unable to pay their their uh, loans back. But by far the biggest problem that the farmer is going to have is overproduction. He is making far too much. He is producing far too much. He is trying to get too much planted and too much harvested. And what this does for him is it drives the price of his agricultural products down and he is unable to make ends meet. This is a short ditty called The Kansas Fool, which emerged, emerged somewhere in the 19th century. It goes, we have the land to raise the wheat and everything that's good to eat. And when we had no bonds or debts, we were a jolly happy set. Oh, Kansas Fool, poor Kansas Fool, the banker makes of you a tool. I look across the fertile plain, big crops made so by gentle rain. But 12 cent corn gives me alarm and makes me want to sell my farm. With abundant crops raised everywhere, tis a mystery, I do declare, why farmers all should fume and fret and why we are all, or why we are so deep in debt. The farmer's problems are really evident to us from the 21st century when we look back on the Kansas Fool. With abundant crops raised everywhere, tis a mystery, I do declare. We know that supply and demand governs the marketplace. And when you have too much of something, that's what's going to drive the prices down. And the, the, the farmers can blame the railroads, and there's certainly problems there. And the farmers can blame the grain elevators, and there's certainly problems there. But the farmer's biggest problem is, say it with me, that's right, overproduction. They are unable to control the amount that they are making. The two posters that you're looking at here come from a group called the Grange. The Grange organized in 1875, and together they tried to regulate the railroad rates and the storage fees shared by the railroads, the warehouses, and grain elevators through state legislation. So the Grange is trying to alleviate the problems that we see with overproduction. Notice they're not suggesting that the farmers plant less, they are suggesting that we remedy this problem through what they would consider to be appropriate legislation. So who do the Grangers blame for their problems? Well, they blame the railroads. They say the railroads are overcharging them, the railroads are pooling and running a monopoly at the farmer's expense. Now they are correct. The railroads are not acting what we would uh, consider today to be ethically and certainly not what we would consider today to be legal. But the, again, the Grangers' biggest problem is overproduction. Also, they blame the grain elevators for overcharging, for pooling and running a monopoly at the farmer's expense. This is absolutely true. The grain elevators are privately owned and they're taking advantage of the farmer. But what is the farmer's biggest problem? It's overproduction. And lastly, they blame the federal government. Both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, are at fault for, I want you to pay attention to this, failing to increase the money supply and bring the farmer out of debt. What they're going to start asking for is an increase in the amount of silver that is currently in circulation. Uh, the government went off of the silver standard in 1873 and went on to the gold standard. And what that did was that took a whole lot of metal out of circulation and if you were in debt then that is gonna, it's going to make it harder for you to achieve that debt because the value of money is going to be higher. This is what's known as the Farmer's Declaration of Independence, written in 1875 when the Grangers organized. It says, we therefore, the producers of the state in our several countries, counties assembled, do solemnly declare that we will use all lawful and peaceful means to free ourselves from the tyranny of monopoly. That to this end, we hereby declare ourselves absolutely free and independent of all past political connections, and that we will give our suffrage, that's our vote, 
only to such men for office as we have good reason to believe will use their best endeavors to the promotion of these ends and, their, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on divine providence, that's God, we mutually pledge to each other our fortunes and our sacred honor. And that's a really fancy and powerful way of saying, see you later, Republicans and Democrats. We are only going to vote for men that we believe are in the farmer's best interests. Now, who are those people that they're going to put their votes behind? So the populists are going to throw their vote behind this guy. His name is James B. Weaver. Now, James B. Weaver used to be a Republican from Iowa, a farming state and a Western state. But James Weaver became disillusioned with the Republican Party following the Civil War because of its increasing conservatism. Now, the Republican Party, as you recall, used to be the party of the Westerner. It used to be the party of the Homestead Act. It used to be the party of the Transcontinental Railroad, and it used to want to settle the West. And in the 1870s, what you see is the Republican Party becoming more and more beholden to the interests of the northern industrialist and industrialist and less responsive to the need of the Westerner. So James B. Weaver is going to decide he's going to run for president himself in 1880, and he's going to pull 3.3 percent of the popular vote. Now, you're thinking, oh, that's not a lot. Obviously, he's not going to win. No, you've never heard of him. But if a third party today pulled 3.3 percent of the popular vote, we would definitely notice. Now, this is the sort of things that James Weaver supports, and these are why the farmers and the West are going to like him. He supports increasing the money supply. That would be to add silver to the money supply. He supports the federal regulation of businesses, and especially the railroads. And eventually he finds a home with the Grangers and with his uh, his coalition they go ahead and they formed what's called the Populist Party or also called the People's Party and that happens in 1891. James Weaver in 1891 says, in, the, in their delirium of greed, the managers of our transportation system, he's talking about the railroad tycoons, disregard both private right and the public welfare. Today they will combine and bankrupt their weak, their weak rivals and by the expenditure of a trifling sum possess them, themselves of properties which cost the outlay of millions. Tomorrow they will capitalize their booty for five times the cost, issue their bonds, and proceed to levy tariffs upon the people to pay dividends upon the fraud. So James Weaver obviously doesn't think much of the railroad tycoons. He wants them regulated. He wants them to be brought to account, so he would think, to the party of the people, the populists. The populists are going to indirectly score two legislative successes against the power of big railroad interests and the trusts, the monopolies that they believe are keeping them in such uh, miserable conditions. Those are called the Interstate Commerce Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act, and I definitely want you to pay attention to what both of these do. So by 1890, people look around and they ask themselves, what happened to the free market? What happened to laissez-faire? Uh, if you took note in 1890, monopolies had become so powerful that in some industries there is no more free market. There is no more competition. Certainly not in the case of, say, Standard Oil, in which uh, Rockefeller owns 90% of all of the oil share in the United States. But this is especially true of the railroads by 1890. They are no longer competing with it with one another. The railroad companies had combined and they had pooled and they had rebated their way to complete dominance of the industry. Customers simply could not shop around for a better deal when every railroad out there is pooling with every other railroad out there to set prices and make them artificially high. Workers 
uh, cannot negotiate with the railroad owners for a better wage, and customers cannot negotiate for, with the railroad owners for a better wage. The railroad owners have pretty much eliminated what they consider to be wasteful competition. And who loses? The customer loses. And so this political cartoon shows Vanderbilt, the chief uh, railroad cartoon, sitting on top of the steps of the Capitol building. And below him, you see the poor farmer drowning to death. And it says things like watered stocks, water wabash, and watered stocks. Watered stocks are, of course, when you uh, deliberately misrepresent the value of your company so that you can bring in more uh, investors. And of course, what happens when when uh, it's discovered is your investors go belly up, they pull out, and who loses? The customers lose. And Vanderbilt has actually gone on record as saying, the public be damned, why can't I do what I, want, what I want with my money? And you see, there he is, the Colossus of the New Age, standing atop this huge empire, and all of those trains are feeding into it, and all of those people are holding, himself, are holding him up. So, in 1887, Congress is at last going to act against these railroad tycoons. The action that Congress takes in 1887 is known as the Interstate Commerce Act. Very significant, very important. You really want to make a note of what it is. The Interstate Commerce Act says that the railroads have to publish standard rates. They can't just decide when you walk up to do business with them what they're going to charge. You have to be fair with one customer to the next. It prohibits rebates. That is a special deal for, say, John D. Rockefeller and another deal for somebody else because you think you can get more money out of someone else. So I walk up to the railroads. They say, this guy doesn't have a whole lot to, to offer. Let's try to charge him a, a, an unfair price. Whereas Rockefeller, we really want his money. Let's charge, give him a special rebate or a lower price and hopes that he'll be able to uh, we'll keep his business. That is now being made illegal. Pooling is made illegal where the railroad companies are going to get together with one another and artificially set their prices high so that they do not have to uh, compete. Price discrimination is going to be made illegal by this. Again, you've got to be fair to all customers and you've got to tell them up front what are you going to charge. Did the Interstate Commerce Act work? Well, no, it, it, it didn't really work. Railroads became adept at overcoming the obstacles. They found other ways to incorporate. They found other ways to do things. Um, there wasn't really a mechanism of enforcement, and that made the Interstate Commerce Act difficult to enforce, at least until the days of Theodore Roosevelt, where he really gives it some teeth. Nevertheless, I want you to pay attention. Know that this is a red letter law. This is a watershed law. It is the first time in American history that the federal government is going to step in and attempt to regulate the marketplace. So essentially the federal government is saying with the Interstate Commerce Act, laissez-faire, no more, you're going to play by certain rules. And there's a cartoon of the intended purpose of the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. There's government regulation hammering the trains, hammering the railroad tycoons into submission. Now, the second of these red letter laws I want you to pay attention to is called the Sherman Antitrust Act, passed by Congress in 1890. This is going to prohibit the combination of businesses that seek to restrict competition and maximize profits for their own um, benefit. So a trust is now officially illegal. John D. Rockefeller and his buying up of all competition is now officially illegal. Now I think this is an irony because this is government regulation in the service of the free market. And the free market is not supposed to have government regulation, but the problem is what happens when the, this, this economic freedom gives us so many monopolies that there's no longer uh, a, a market mechanism at work here. Again, did this one work? No, not really. 
Businesses simply cooperated informally rather than on paper. And again, there's no real regulatory device. There's no uh, Sherman Antitrust Act police force that's going to go out and do this. Nevertheless, it shows that the U.S. government is moving away from a commitment to laissez-faire ideals and more toward regulation of the economy. Now let's get back to our angry farmers and talk about the political party that they're going to form in 1892 called the Populists. And there they are in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892. Those are the founding members of the People's Party, also known as the Populists. Now, what sort of things do these populists want? The populists are calling for government ownership of the railroads. That's right. They want government ownership of the means of production. They also want government ownership of the telegraphs and the grain elevators. And you're saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Gillespie, isn't that socialism? And I say, yes, yes it is. When you're talking about government ownership of the means of production, that by definition is socialism. Another thing they call for is a graduated income tax. Now, at this point in American history, there is no income tax at all. And what they're asking for is a tax on the amount of money that you make. Graduated, meaning the more money you make, the more money you pay in taxes. Another thing they want is term limits for senators. And we still don't have that. A senator can run for as many terms as he or she, at this time it was he, wants to and there would be uh, nothing to stop him. They also want what's called the Australian or the secret ballot. So they want your, your vote to be secret. At this point, your vote is not a secret. People could demand to know it, and the political bosses of the big cities, this is how they maintain their control, is by coercing you to vote for, for them, and they could find out. So what does each of these do? Government ownership of the railroads and government ownership of the telegraphs and the grain elevators is going to remove the profit motive and it's going to give the farmer free and unlimited access so they don't have to pay for use of the of the railroads anymore or they would pay a minimal government set price. When you remove the profit motive, that makes it free for everybody. And you say, wait, this is socialism. Yes, it's socialism. Get it through your head. The, pop, the, the populist party was in part a socialist party. Not totally, they're not waving the red flag, they're not heading the way of Moscow in 1917, but they do want to see government ownership of the means of production to some degree. Uh, the graduated income tax, of course, is to tax the wealthy at a higher rate. They believe this would be beneficial to the United States because it would be a way to raise revenue and that way they could get rid of the tariff. That's right, because they're farmers, they have to export, they don't like the tariff. They believe that a term limit for senators would prevent career politicians. It would prevent uh, people from simply living up there in Washington and make them more accountable to the people. And of course, you can figure out the Australian or the secret ballot is to bring about um, uh, fairness in voting and prevent uh, intimidation. So it would prevent the farmers from, or anybody, from being intimidated to have to give up or vote a certain way. Got to keep on going. I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't fit it all on one slide. Another thing that the populists want are federal loans to farmers. They want the abolition. That's right, the outright abolition of all national banks. They're, they're they are classic Jeffersonian, in a sense, and certainly um, 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 Jacksonian Westerners. They do not like banks. They believe banks serve the interests of the rich and the wealthy and the North. They want immigration restriction as well. And their, 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 their chief um, platform, that which is a, a deal breaker for them, you've got to have it. It's the free coinage of silver, which would give you inflation of the money supply at a ratio of 16 to 1. They want uh, silver to enter into national circulation, and what that would do is it would bring the farmer out of debt. So 
Federal loans to farmers, that's to bring them out of debt. Abolition of national banks, that would cancel all the loans that they believe are illegitimate in the first place and it would bring the farmers out of debt. Immigration restriction is there to raise wages. If we don't have immigrants coming in and competing for jobs in the West and in the East, then we can make an, a decent living without those people to compete with. And, of course, the free coinage of silver, bring that farmer out of debt by increasing the money supply and bringing the value of that money down. So let's take a closer look at the financial situation that the farmers are in. In the 19th century, since, since 1873, the United States is on the gold standard. This means that for every dollar in your pocket, there is a certain amount of gold in the U.S. Treasury which it represents. Now the problem with that is that the value of gold can go up or down depending on international supply. So if somebody in, I don't know, Alaska or South Africa stumbles upon a gold mine and puts that money, that gold, into the international circulation, then you're going to see the value of the dollar on which it is based go down. So if the supply is constant, or it decreases, then the real value of the dollar increases. Let's keep going. Now this is great. If you're the bank and you have people that owe you money, then you want the value of the dollar to remain high because that means they owe you more in real value. But if you're the farmer, this sucks. If you're the guy who, own, who who's holding the debt, if you're the debtor and you're watching the, the uh, money supply restrict and become more and more based on this precious metal that's becoming more and more scarce, then the value of your debt is going up. So if you owe $100 one day, and then the gold on which that $100 is based is suddenly um, in, in, uh, in greater demand, then the value of that $100 debt is going to be greater, and you're not going to be happy. So this is why the populists are demanding the injection of silver into the money supply, into the monetary supply of the United States, because they want the value of their debt to go down and so they can pay it off. So that's the big question. The free coinage of silver, this is what they want, at a rate of 16 to 1 would increase the money supply, which is what the farmers want, and they would help to bring the farmer out of debt. So this is their main platform, the free coinage of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1. So let's look again at the list of populist demands, things that the populists formed in 1892 wanted to see happen. Which of these things eventually came to be? Did we ever have government ownership of the railroads, or did we ever get a graduated income tax, or federal loans to farmers? Did any of these things ever happen? So let's take a look. How about the first two, government ownership of the railroads, government ownership of the telegraphs and grain elevators? No, we never get that. Socialism, right? We don't like socialism uh, in the United States. Socialist measures very rarely pass. Do we ever get a graduated income tax? Yes, we do. That's under the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. We get the 16th Amendment, which provides for a graduated income tax. The more money you make, the more money you pay. Do we ever get term limits for senators? No, we don't. But the 17th Amendment does give us direct election of senators. So it isn't state legislators that appoint your uh, senator anymore. Now the people, according to the 17th Amendment, elect our senators, and that's the way it's been. Uh, since, again, the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Do we have an Australian or a secret ballot? Yes, we do. It was a, on a state-by-state -state basis, and Kentucky was the last one in 1892. So I want to point out that this happened in 1892, and it was on the platform of the Populist Party, but the Populist Party didn't make it happen. They were essentially championing a... Um, 
championing a measure that was already widely talked about. What about federal loans for farmers? Absolutely yes. Today we have federal farm su subsidies. They are given to farmers. Uh, it's tons of money and they are supported by both Democrats and Republicans today. Do we have an abolition of national banks? Yeah, kind of. The FDIC, which was established during the New Deal, is sort of a federal insurance uh, agency, which is going to give everybody a, a check to the tune of um, $200,000 in case banks go under. Do we ever get immigration restriction? Yes, we do. The National Origins Act of 1921 and 1924 are going to limit the amount of immigrants that we are gonna take from certain places. So, uh, you know, a lot of what the, the populace wanted uh, were eventually met by other parties. So if you take a look at the, uh, the populist poster here, have a look. You've got on the one hand, the Republican Party is the builder of corporate wealth, which is what they are largely becoming by the late 19th century. The Democratic Party, they're being accused of being the builders of saloons and jails. And that's because they see this party as shifting to the interests of the North as well. And the People's Party, Builders of churches and schools. Well, what could be more down to earth and what could be more democratic than people who build churches and schools? So, hey, I'm voting for the People's Party. How about you? Well, in the election of 1892, how did this work out? The populists actually take five states. Look at that five states and they pull 22 electoral votes. That is wildly successful for a third party. They, they uh, almost take 10% of the national popular votes, which are going to Weaver. Plus they have some congressional victories as well. 12 house seats, five Senate seats, dozens of national elections go to the populists. So they seem to be a really popular, popular, ha uh, um, an influential third party. Don't forget the most successful third party, the most successful third party in history is who? It's not that hard. The Republicans in 1860 took the White House, folks. Just a quick breakdown of the West, which is where most of the populist gains or all the populist gains were. You can see I mean, shades of green where you had a populist party victory, where you had a populist party winning 20, per, 20 to 50 percent of the popular vote, where they uh, polled less than 20 percent, and then of course where people are ineligible. So you have the West, which is the populist stronghold. Why didn't they become more successful is the question because they seem to have a whole lot of the country voting for them. The populist problem is with the South. Why didn't the populists take the South? Well, a guy named Tom Watson, who is a Georgia populist, tried to make an appeal to black people black sharecroppers, black farmers who were caught in the system of debt peonage. It is in their interest to vote for the populist party without a doubt. And Tom Watson says to them, the accident of color can make no difference in the interests of farmers, croppers, and laborers. You are kept apart that you may, separate, that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. And so the, the South goes with the Democratic Party as the South has. The Remember the Solid South made this pledge, this sacred pledge, never to vote for a Republican and a populist. Well, a populist seems to be almost just as bad. So in 1892, the South chooses white supremacy over economic prosperity. And they do it in all sorts of illegal, and unethical ways through voter fraud, through ballot stuffing, through intimidation and violence. And one George Democrat simply throws up in his hands and says, we had to do it. Those damned populists would ruin the country. So 
So at this point, let's ask, what do third parties want? And the populists are a third party, not a Democrat, not a Republican. Do third parties expect to win? Actually, I don't think they do. What third parties want to do is they want to draw votes from one of the other one of the other two parties, either the Democrats or the Republicans, and demonstrate their power. You see, take for example the Tea Party, which is probably going to end up becoming a third party in American politics. The Tea Party really doesn't expect to elect a Tea Party candidate. What they expect to do is send a message to the Republican Party, which is closer to their ideology than the Democrats, that you can't win without us. And so if they start running their own candidates, they will draw attention and support from the main Republican Party and actually end up uh, electing a Democrat. And so if the Republicans expect to continue into the 21st century, they're going to have to address the Tea Party's needs in some, some regard. Otherwise, they can't hope to win. So when the populists begin to take some very left-leaning positions and they begin to demand things that people on the left wing of the political spectrum want to hear about, the Democratic Party is the party that takes notice and they come up with an idea. The idea is going to be best articulated by William Jennings Bryan. He's a rising star in democratic politics. He's a critic of Gilded Age plutocracy that would be government by the wealthy. He is known as an advocate of Western and Southern values. He's seen as somebody who stands up for the farmer and the uh, and the common man, he considers, considers himself something of a Jacksonian in spirit. And he is an uncompromising silverite, which means he supports the free coinage of silver. Now, William Jennings Bryan is best known today. He runs for the presidency three times. But he is best known today for his cross of gold speech, which I'm going to show you now. When he receives the Democratic nomination for the presidency in Chicago in 1896, he captivates the nation with his cross of gold speech. And I know it's long, but it's definitely worth looking at. He says, you come to us and tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. I tell you that the great cities rest upon these broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. Our ancestors, when but three million, had the courage to declare their political independence of every other nation upon earth. Shall we, their descendants, when we have grown to seventy million, declare that we are less dependent than our forefathers? No, my friends, it will never be but the judgment of these, this people. Therefore, we care not upon what lines the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but we cannot have it till some nation helps us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard because England has, we shall restore bimetallism and let England have bimetallism because the United States have. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we shall then, we shall fight them to the utmost, having behind us the producing masses of the nation and the world, having behind us the commercial interests and the laboring interests and all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Stirring rhetoric from William Jennings Bryan. Those words resonate with farmers. It's full of populist angst and even evangelical fervor. And he's, he knows his audience, and he knows the churches that they go to, and he understands the sort of rhetoric to which they will respond. Listen to it again. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Powerful. 
The Republicans, on the other hand, are running for exactly the opposite principles. William McKinley, you see his picture here, and his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, they declare we stand for the gold standard, protection and prosperity, just pension laws, and to redeem all Republican pledges to the people. But more than anything, they stand for the gold standard. And that sends a message. The Republican Party does not stand with the farmer. It does not stand with the South. The Republican Star Party stands with the Northern Industrialist. And it stands with the Northern Bankers. And by saying we stand for the gold standard, they are declaring that to be the case. So in the election of 1896, the Democrats run William Jennings Bryan. And the Republicans win uh, run William McKinley. Brian, as we know, free coinage of silver, 16 to 1 ratio. McKinley, stay on the gold standard. Brian wants a lower tariff, as Westerners and Southerners and agricultural interests have always wanted, they want a lower tariff. McKinley, on the other hand, he stays with the high tariff. So you can see the two are completely opposite. One is agricultural, Western, Southern, as the other is Northern and banking and commerce. Brian is for an income tax. With an income tax, then we, the government can raise money through another means other than the tariff. What McKinley favors is what they're going to favor in the 20s, what uh, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover are going to favor in the 20s, and what Ronald Reagan is going to favor in the 1980s, and that would be something called trickle-down economics. The idea is you support big business, you support big banking, you support the great money interests of the North, and the wealth will trickle down to everybody else when they hire and when they, when they uh, produce. William McKinley is for the regulation of monopoly. And of course, William McKinley is for laissez-faire. So it's a clear distinction between the two parties. But of course, the main issue is the free coinage of silver. And we can see that when we look at this political cartoon. The silver dog with the golden tail. And you can see the dog has the golden tail. In other words, where's the golden tail? Look at the dog's tail. It's in the Northeast. It's in Maine. It's in Vermont. It's in New York. It's in those uh, industrializing northern states. And where's the silver dog? It's everybody else. He's in the West. It's a little bit of an of a exaggeration, but the cartoonist is asking, Who's going to drive the election in 1896? Is it going to be the farming interests of the South or the manufacturing and banking interests of the North? Now, at this point, you're probably asking, Mr. Gillespie, wait, I thought the Progressive Party was the one that was standing on the free coinage of silver and the graduated income tax and all of these things. And you say, where did the Progressive Party go? I think this cartoon explains it. What do third parties want? They want to send a message to the other party. And so this is a bit confusing. Even though the uh, William Jennings Bryan's head is on the populist party and he's swallowing up the Democratic Party, that is exactly what is happening. The populists are eating the Democratic Party. And so the Democratic Party is going to become, well... The Populist Party, at least in part. The Democratic Party, which is the larger party of the two, is swallowing up the platform of the smaller party. And that's exactly what, Democrat, or what third parties want to happen. They want to send the message that the major parties cannot exist without us. And so here's the outcome of the election of 1896. Who won? It's hard to tell from this map. The North wins, or I should say, the Republican Party wins, but it's just barely. Look at it. William McKinley pulls 271 electoral votes, the Democratic Party 176 electoral votes. Look at the popular vote. 
7 million, 102,000 and some, versus 6 million. The Democratic Party is not trailing too far behind, and most of the population is in the North still, and they're going to take this election. But it wasn't exactly a landslide. We're going to shift gears now, and we're going to go to the North. To the industrial cities and we're going to look at the consequences of the gilded age of industrialization and how some people are responding to them. We're going to start with folks called the muckrakers. Well you're thinking to yourself that's an interesting name doesn't sound like a very fun job. What is a muckraker? A muckraker is a coalition of reporters for popular magazines so they're journalists and these magazines are going to put a lot of money and a lot of time in researching and digging up the muck, hence the name the muckrakers. And the name actually comes from uh, President Roosevelt in 1906. These investigative journalers, journalists are trying to make the public aware of problems that need fixing. T.R. himself says, the man with the muckrake, the man who could, know, who could look no way but downward, with the muckrake in his hand, who was offered a celestial crown for his muckrake, but who would neither look up nor regard the crown he was offered, but continue to rake to himself the filth on the floor. So T.R. doesn't think much of the muckrakers. He thinks they spend too much time digging up filth than actually doing anything useful. T.R. Theodore Roosevelt writes, Now, it is very necessary that we should not flinch from seeing what is, what is vile and debasing. There is filth on the floor and must be scraped up with the muckrake. And there are times and places where this service is the most needed of all the services that can be performed. But, says T.R., the man who never does anything else, who never thinks or speaks or writes, save of his feats with the muckrake, speedily becomes not a help to society, not an indictment to good, but one of the most potent forces for evil. So again, the TR thinks the muckrakers have a place, but for heaven's sake, let's not spend all of our time looking at the filth on the floor. This world has a little bit more to offer. So the muckrakers are these folks. I'll name them and you may just take some space in your notes so you can write down what they're most famous for. Ida Tarbell. She's going to be most famous for taking down Standard Oil through an expose on John D. Rockefeller. Jacob Rees is a New York photographer who is going to spend his time going through the tenement slums and taking photographs of how the other half lives, and he's going to publish a book in 1890 called How the Other Half Lives. Upton Sinclair is going to take some time going through the meat packing industry in Chicago and detailing the wretched conditions in which our food is prepared. And he's going to write a book in 1906 called The Jungle, which is going to churn stomachs and will continue to churn stomachs. Upton Sinclair is going to write a book on the shame of the cities. Now, Upton Sinclair is going to take on the problem of political graft or political corruption. Ida Tarbell is one of these muckraking journalists who wrote for a magazine called McClure's. And in 1921, she made her name by publishing what's called the History of Standard Oil Company, aka the Mother of Trusts. Now, what happens as a result of this is that Congress begins to investigate Standard Oil and they end up breaking up Standard Oil under the Antitrust Act. And I want you to watch the short film and answer the questions that follow. Our next muckraker is a man named Jacob Rees. Jacob Rees is a Danish immigrant, and he was the police commissioner of New York City for a time. In the year 1890, he published a book called How the Other Half Lives. And in this book, it chronicles his story as he goes through the tenements, the, the living conditions of New York's urban poor. And with his camera, he documents what he sees. And the photographs that follow are from Jacob Reese's 1890 uh, expose, How the Other Half Lives.
Our next muckraker is a man named Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair is actually a socialist. He would like to see the uh, major means of production owned by the people or owned by the government. But he's best known for his sensational 1906 novel, The Jungle. What he wanted to do was to describe the conditions of canning factory workers and thereby agitate for socialism to improve those conditions. Instead, what Americans read in the jungle were these vivid descriptions of uh, conditions in the meatpacking industry and how disgusting the process by which the food is prepared. And so the jungle actually influenced, influenced consumers not to demand socialism, but to demand regulation in the um, meatpacking industry. And so here's an excerpt from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. He writes, there would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip all over it, and thousands of rats would race on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. This is no fairy story and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift a rat lift out a rat even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. So that's just one selection from the jungle. Um, doesn't do much for your appetite, but it did motivate a lot of American consumers to say, hey, we need stronger regulation in the meatpacking industry so that we're not eating dead poisoned rats. So these are some of the outrageous claims that are made by advertisers in, uh, in the 1890s, in the uh, Gilded Age. Cancer can be cured. Blindness can be cured. I like this one. Uh, let's give cocaine to children because it'll help alleviate their toothaches. So all of these things are examples of an unregulated advertising industry. And so the jungle is in part responsible for the Pure Food and Drug Act, and you can see the date it was passed in 1906, and this is under the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. It allows for federal inspection of food drugs and products intended for human consumption. It requires all foods to carry labels so that you know exactly what it is that you are ingesting. And it set industry standards for meat packing and food handling. And an attempt to rescue an industry in trouble after the publication of the jungle. So a lot of people look at the pure food and drug industry as the you know big government coming in and trying to put all these uh, regulations uh, on big business. But actually, what this was was big government trying to come in and rescue an industry that nobody wanted to touch too much after um, after the publication of the jungle. So we move on to our next muckraker, who's a man by the name of, by the name of Lincoln Steffens. And he publishes his book called The Shame of the Cities, again in McClure's Magazine, which is an article exposing alliances between big corporations and local government. Lincoln Steffen writes, bribery is no ordinary felon, but treason, corruption, which breaks out here and there, and now is and now and then is not an occasional offense, but a common practice. And the effect uh, the effect of it is to literally change the form of our government from one that is representative of the people to an oligarchy representative of special interests. And this is literally true. The machine controls the whole process of voting and practices fraud at every stage. The assessor's list is the voting list, and the assessor is the machine's man. So he thinks that, yeah, 
uh, democracy is not allowed to run its course, that the people do not have a voice. Instead, it's these political machines, whether they are controlled by corporate interests or otherwise, the people do not have a say. So these political machines that Lincoln Steffen is talking about here are these organizations of very corrupt politicians. They control tax rates, they're going to give tax breaks to their political allies, they're going to control prices, businesses, etc. They are going to steal millions from taxpayers using fraud and inflation. And you're wondering how do these people stay uh, in business? What's keeping, why do people not vote them out? What they do is they will meet the, the immigrants who are arriving on Ellis Island or otherwise, and they will do these philanthropy works for them. They'll find them a job, they'll find them some clothes, they'll find them a place to live in exchange for votes. And so the public image of the political machines is that of a man of the people. They do these philanthropic uh, enterprises. They engage in this philanthropy in exchange for votes. So they gave money to support businesses and immigrants in return for the votes. So to your average immigrant who gets off the boat and doesn't have any kind of experience with democracy or for the or with the democratic process, here is the mayor of the town or the mayor's representative right there to meet you, and he's going to set you up with everything you would want, and all he wants is your is your vote, and you'd say, "Great, that's fine. This is democracy. It works for me." But people like Lincoln Steffens and the progressive reformers had simply had enough of this. They had had enough of the, the Congress being controlled by large corporate interests like the Steel Beam Trust and the Cooper Trust. And then you see Standard Oil popping out there as well. So a number of reforms, progressive reforms, are going to come out of this. So the first one is called the Initiative. The initiative is the process of directly petitioning a legislature to introduce a bill. And you'll recall, this was part of the Populist Party platform in 1891, along with what's called the referendum and the recall. The initiative is intended to make the people more responsible for their laws and allow them to make political decisions rather than the legislature. So it empowers the people to introduce legislation. So Joe Citizen can simply go and get enough people to sign a petition and introduce this to the legislature. So not just your elected representatives controlling the legislative process, but the people. Okay. The second one is called the referendum. And this is simply when the people, again, notice I keep highlighting the people in red, the people vote on laws instead of the state or national governments. The referendum was originated as a populist reform, a populist reform in the populist party, but it was later picked up by progressive uh, reform movement. So people vote on laws instead of the state or national government. So it's in a sense bypassing the legislature and going right to the people. Sometimes you'll hear about these referendums that they have out in California where the people themselves will vote on whether or not they want proposition this or that. That is an example of the referendum at work where the people themselves are going to have a vote on legislation instead of the legislator. Uh, the last one is called the recall, and it's e easy to understand. The people could possibly remove an incompetent politician from office by having a second election, and you would do that through the form of a referendum. So again, if we don't like the person that we have put in office, he's not responsive to our needs, or he's not living up to his um, campaign promises, the people can recall him or remove him from office. So the biggest and definitely take note of of this one as well the biggest progressive reform to come in politics is the 17th amendment the 16th amendment gave congress the power to levy a graduated income tax the 17th amendment says the senate of the united states shall be composed of two senators from each state elected by that's right who's in bold the people 
Therefore, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. That doesn't change. The senators in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislatures. So what has happened with the 17th Amendment? The people are being given the power to elect their senators. The way the Constitution set it up was that state legislatures are going to elect the senators. So the people wouldn't have that, that say. The people were represented by the House. But now with the 17th Amendment, you have the people directly electing their senators. So it is direct election of senators designed to keep the government accountable to the people and not to special interests. So if you think about it, if uh, by by lowering sort of the, the bar down to the people, the senators are not supposed to be controlled directly by giant corporate interests, but by the people themselves. So Standard Oil isn't going to be able to uh, elect a senator to his liking now the people at least in theory anyway this is how it's supposed to work together all together the progressive political reforms are designed to empower the people in contrast to special interests or corporations or uh, career politicians okay Now today, when we, we think about um, Christians and Christians getting involved in politics, we often go right to the uh, Republican Party. Uh, at least for uh, Christian evangelicals or fundamentalists, that seems to be the sort of the default, um, the default category in which we put them. And there's some truth to that. Um, something like 80% of Protestant evangelicals today are going to vote Republican. In the progressive era, you had a more, I guess, uh, uh, liberal or, or progressive, more radical stream, uh, uh, form of Christian, and they put in place what was called the social gospel. So let's go uh, back and look at how Christianity took root and how it differed in different parts of the country. In the north, You've got a majority Protestant population. Remember, the North was populated by, um, first it was the Congregationalists, the Puritans, and then what followed was going to be your Quakers and your Baptists and folks like that. Now, in the South, they're also primarily Protestant, okay? But the difference is in the North, those Puritans are characterized by a zeal to reform society on moral principles. There you have a guy up in the stocks who are trying to reform him. This is a public uh, way of shaming a guy into being more moral. So Northern Protestants tend to believe that Christianity can be put into action. Christianity can be put into social reform. We can bring about the benevolent empire through uh, engineering good government or something like that. Now, in the South, on the other hand, there is a greater emphasis on personal piety and devotion. And so Southern Protestants, they tend to discourage political involvement. And again, you're, you're looking at maybe the, the political scene today and you've got the Christian right and you've got um, polit or, uh, uh, Christianity, which is very much a part of the political conversation in the South. And I'm putting an asterisk on this. This is going to change in the late 1970s and really change in 1980. But in the 1890s and early 20th century, Protestant Christianity in the South is about personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And in the North, it's characterized more by a reforming zeal. Now, that's not always... Um, it's, it's, this isn't a constant. This isn't absolute. But these are general trends. So in the North, that reformist zeal is going to yield something called the social gospel. And that is what we are mainly going to talk about today. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk more about what happens in the South, which is called fundamentalism. So right now, just kind of keep those, those definitions in your head. Uh, the North embraces the social gospel, and the South turns more toward fundamentalism. So we're going to go to the social gospel now, and fundamentalism we will take care of later. 
So, the social gospel, a definition, is a Protestant Christian intellectual movement that came to prominence during the Progressive Era. Those who adhered to a social gospel sought to apply Christian ethics and, and Christian morality to social problems such as poverty, slums, education, alcoholism, crime, and war. These things are emphasized. While the doctrines of sin, salvation, heaven, and hell, and the future kingdom of God in heaven were downplayed. So in the North, Christianity is going to, be, is going to publicly manifest itself. And in the South, Christianity is privately manifesting itself in the form of personal relationships and personal piety. But this is the social gospel up north. We're going to turn the gospel loose onto the cities and we're going to let Jesus solve our major um, social problems. Will the 20th century, says Walter Rauschenbusch, Will the 20th century mark for the future historian the real adolescence of humanity, the great emancipation from barbarism and from the paralysis of injustice, and the beginning of a process in the intellectual, social, and moral life of mankind to which all past history has no parallel? It will depend almost wholly on the moral forces which the Christian nations can bring to the fighting line against the wrong. The fighting energy of these moral forces will again depend on the degree to which they are inspired by religious faith and enthusiasm. That's from Christianity and the Social Crisis. Here you have a political cartoon called The Double Burden, in which you have the working man crossing the river and who is on his back but one of those great industrialists or one of those middle class guys and what is weighing him down are taxes. So you can see that it's got a religious message to it but it's also got a clear social message. It gets even more pronounced. The famous uh, quote from Jesus in the book of Revelation, behold I stand at the door and knock well, here he is standing at the door and knocking on the office of a, of a businessman and the man is busy at his ledgers and who's inside but the devil. And of course, Jesus is being told, I am busy. I'm too interested in business and not interested enough in the business of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Christianity. I think this one is, is pretty interesting when we start talking about immigration. The Bible verse at the bottom says, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. And so you've got this poor immigrant and you can see he's Jewish. It's got his, uh, he's got the Sabbath uh, desegregation on his back. He's carrying with him poverty, he's carrying with him disease, he's carrying with him all of these problems. And Uncle Stan, Sam is standing there basically about to turn this guy away. So this is a criticism of the immigration policies of the United States. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, says Hebrews 10, 14. And there's Jesus canceling the man's credit. I think this is interesting because this is a metaphor, a Christian metaphor that's being employed to a man who's in prison, to a man who's in debt. And Jesus is visiting not the wealthy industrialist, but the prisoner. And there's a novel that's released in 1896 by a minister named Charles Sheldon. It's called In His Steps. And this novel, I think, really best epitomizes the social gospel in action. It reads, so they were interested in what Maxwell, that's the protagonist of the novel, said. What would Jesus do? He began to apply the question to the social problem in general. The audience was respectfully attentive. If the church members were all doing what doing as Jesus would do, could it remain true that the armies of men would walk the streets for jobs, and hundreds of them curse the church, and thousands of them find in the saloon their best friend? 
how far were the Christians responsible for this human problem that was personally illustrated right in this hall tonight? Was it true that the great city churches would as a rule refuse to walk in Jesus' steps as closely as to suffer, actually suffer for his sake? So it's an indictment of the churches. The churches aren't doing enough to solve the social problems. If the churches were really doing what they were supposed to do, then you wouldn't have armies of homeless people walking around cursing the churches, and you wouldn't have alcoholism and all of these problems. Um, one thing you may, um, you may have picked up on is the phrase, what would Jesus do? That is uh, that phrase which people wear on their arms and wear on t-shirts, at least it was really popular several years ago. What would Jesus do? That originates from Charles Sheldon's In His Steps. Now remember I told you that the I, I characterized this movement as the Christian left, not the Christian right. That is because a lot of Christians are going to associate with the movement of socialism. And you may find that absolutely absurd today. I mean, how could that possibly happen? We've, we live in the age uh, uh, in which, you know, Jerry Falwell and um, Ronald Reagan and, and uh, a lot of, you know, Rex Reed and a lot of your folks have set the, the tone for public Christianity today. And socialism has very little to do with it. But in the 1880s, 1890s, socialism and Christianity found common cause. This is from Frances Willard, and you're going to need to know about Frances Willard now and later because she is the founder of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she founded that in 1879. But look at what she writes. Socialism is the New Testament in action. I believe in the things that Christian socialism stands for, and were I not T totally occupied, that means were I not so occupied with getting alcohol banned, would go into the movement heart and soul, as indeed I have done in public utterances for many years. Oh, that I were young again, and it should have my life. It is God's way out of the wilderness and into the promised land. It is the very marrow and fatness of Christ's gospel. It is Christianity applied. And you think, well, that's absolutely heretical. Jesus was by absolutely no means a socialist. Well, you can think what you want. He is, he isn't, doesn't matter to me. But what is most interesting for us here is that in the 1890s, socialism and Christianity were considered to be complementary um, strains of thought. There are three manifestations of the social gospel that you will probably recognize and I think are worth talking about. The first one is the YMCA. You may or may not have known that the YMCA actually stands for the Young Men's Christian Association. And the first one in the United States was established in 1888 in Springfield, Missouri. Now, the purpose of the YMCA was not just so you could go and get on the treadmill for a while, although physical fitness was a part of their program. It was primarily uh, there is a homeless shelter to give food and shelter and baths to the poor. They were also there to provide moral, spiritual, and yes, this is where your treadmills and weightlifting comes in, physical training. The second one that I want to look at is called the Salvation Army. And you know them as the guys that stand out in front of the mall and ring bells and try to give you to donate to their institution. That is definitely what they are today. But the uh, Salvation Army started off with a group of committed Christians believing that they should take the message of Jesus out of the churches and into the streets. They followed what they called the three S's, soup, soap, and salvation. And so the ministry aimed itself at the people that well-respecting churches often, or well-respected churches often overlooked. That would be the homeless, the prostitutes, and the otherwise destitute. I know I said three, but I got to bring this one up too.
And then, of course, there is the problem of lynching, which only got worse as the Gilded Age um, drew on. 190 recorded lynchings between 1870 and 1879, and then as Jim Crow laws set in and the Republican Party turns away from its commitment to civil rights in the South, that number just skyrockets between 1880 and 1889. You've got 1,200 lynchings. These are the ones that were actually reported by the authorities. And of course, of course this coincides with Plessy v. Ferguson. This coincides with, um, with uh, the establishment of Jim Crow laws in the South. One of the loudest voices to protest this injustice comes from Ida B. Wells, who is an African-American journalist. The lynching of blacks so outraged her that she took action by starting her own newspaper called Free Speech. There she urged her African-American readers to protest lynching publicly despite the public consequences, and she called for a boycott of segregated streetcars and white-owned stores. She spoke out despite the threats to her life. In a sense, IDB Wells was ahead of her time in the methods that she... It's pop quiz time. The question is, which other black civil rights leader is best known for his use of the boycott in order to draw attention and dramatize his message? Would it be Marcus Garvey? Would it be Martin Luther King Jr.? Or would it be Malcolm X? Answer, of course, is Martin Luther King Jr., who was the pastor of the um, Dexter Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, which helped to organize the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, where Rosa Parks becomes famous. But back to the progressive era, there are two black civil rights leaders that we're gonna take a look at. One of them is named Booker T. Washington, and the other one is named W.E.B. Du Bois. Washington was actually born into slavery shortly before the Civil War ended. Now, he rises up in the world through educating himself, and he encourages blacks to keep to themselves, focus on the daily tasks of survival, and essentially to keep quiet. Don't lead a grand uprising, don't agitate for, for civil rights, sort of keep the peace. He believed that by building, strong, building a strong economic base for black people was more critical at this time than fighting for equal rights. And so to meet this goal, he founds in Atlanta the Tuskegee Institute which is to teach black Americans industrial skills, blue collar vocations. His quote, and he gives this speech to a group of white people in the what's called the Atlanta Compromise in 1895. He says, to those of the white race who look to the incoming of those of foreign birth and strange tongues and habits for, for the prosperity of the South, were I permitted, I would repeat what I say to my own race. Cast down your bucket where you are. He's, he's speaking to white people, by the way, to white middle class people when he says, cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down among the eight millions of Negroes whose habits you know, whose fidelity and love you have tested in days when to have proved treacherous meant the ruin of your firesides. Cast down your bucket among these people who have, without strikes and labor wars, tilled your fields, cleared your forests, built your railroads and cities, and brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth and helped to make possible this magnificent representation of the progress of the South. So, essentially, Washington is urging his white audience to trust in black ingenuity and in black progress. When he says, cast down your buckets where you are, he's asking the white industrialists of the South, the few that there are, to invest in black labor. 
Now, Washington's harshest critic was a man named W.E.B. Du Bois. W.B. E. Du Bois was the first black man to receive his Ph.D. from Harvard University. And he believed that Washington's cast your bucket down where you are pacifist style plan is only going to perpetuate the second class citizen uh, mindset. He believes that immediate and ceaseless agitation on the part of black people is the only way to obtain equal rights. He doesn't want to go into a second-rate job. He doesn't want to go and encourage black people to settle for blue-collar jobs. He believes that black people should be the future leaders, the future doctors and lawyers and teachers of the next generation. He doesn't want to settle for simple blue-collar mindset. And he wants to fight segregation. He wants to go into battle. He wants to fight Jim Crow in the courts and in the Congress. And he wants meaningful legislation to be passed to empower black people. And to this end, he helps to found what's called the Niagara Movement in 1909. And that later becomes the NAACP which is an acronym that stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Let's take a, take a closer look at W.E.B. Du Bois's program. He writes, It is possible and probable that nine millions of men can make effective progress in economic lines if they are deprived of political rights, made a servile caste, and allowed only the most meager chance for developing their exceptional men? No! If history and reason give any distinct answer to these questions, it is an empathetic no. Such men, the thinking classes of American Negroes, feel in conscience bound to ask of this nation three things. What does Du Bois want? He says, I want the right to vote. I want civil equality, meaning I want uh, rec recognition, um, equality before the law under the 14th Amendment, essentially. essentially. And he wants the education of youth, according to ability. They do not expect that the free right to vote, to enjoy civil, civic rights, and to be educated will come in a moment. They do not expect to see the bias and prejudices of years disappear at the blast of a trumpet. But they are certain, absolutely certain, that the way for a people to gain their reasonable rights is not by voluntarily throwing them away and insisting that they do not want them. That the way for a people to gain respect is not by continually belittling and ridiculing themselves. That, on the contrary, Negroes must insist continually, in season and out of season, that voting is necessary to modern manhood, that color discrimination is barbarism, and that black boys need education as well as white boys. That is from W.E.B. Du Bois's masterpiece written in 1906, The Souls of Black Folks. My last quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring oneself through the eyes of others. One never feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. It's one of his most famous passages from the Souls of Black Folk about the two-ness that uh, he says that black people feel in America, being both black and being an American. The last section that we're going to look at is organized labor. We're looking back to the labor unions and what do they want as uh, time wears on, how does labor change in the midst of the progressive era? And what we're going to look at specifically is something called socialism. Now that's a word that a lot of people have thrown around a whole lot. Well, that's just socialist, or this is just socialist, or what that president or this president wants is socialist. Well, what is an actual socialist? We have to get a working definition down if we're going to call something socialist or not socialist. So, socialism is based 
primarily in the West on a European thinker uh, named Karl Marx. Now it has other folks who are known as the utopian socialists of the 19th century, but today most socialists are going to trace their um, their beginnings to somebody called Karl Marx who wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Now Karl Marx believes that capitalism, laissez-faire, the free market, only serves the captains of industry. It serves only the wealthy. And that as time goes on, capital or money will accumulate in the hands of the wealthy and the workers the people who work for those guys are going to be worse and worse off. And so he believes that the working man should control the means of production. The means of production would be the great factory. The means of production would be the, the steel factory or the oil refineries or uh, whatever. That which does the majority of production and employing. By taking the profit motive out of it, he believes equality will be the result. So that is socialism. The thing that I really want you to recognize about socialism is that it calls for the public ownership of the means of production, public ownership of the major job producers in the country. And by public, we mean government, to nationalize it, to make the government own something. So on the economic scale, on the one hand, on the, on the right, you have fascism. And on the left end of the, of the uh, economic scale, economic spectrum, you have communism. So where is everybody? Republicans are probably just to the right of the center, and the Democrats are probably just to the left of the center. Now, the Tea Party is perhaps to the right of the Republicans, and I don't think that's an arguable statement. Socialists, on the other hand, are far to the left of even the American Democratic Party. I know there's a whole lot of rhetoric being tossed around Democrats or socialists in the broad sweep of, of politics worldwide. The Democratic Party is not socialist. Socialists, again, would call for government or public ownership of the means of production. The Democrats are not calling for that. Socialists would. So, Democrats are not socialists. Republicans are not fascists. Here I am on record. Don't you go home and tell anybody I said anything to the contrary. Republicans are slightly right. Democrats are slightly left. That's about where we're going to leave it. Now, I want you to recall... What are the goals of labor unions? What do they want? Well, generally, they want to equalize the playing field between the owner and the worker. They want to give the working man an equal voice with that of the capitalist. And their demands are generally pretty modest when you look at what they want. They want things like the eight-hour day. Uh, would they want workers' compensation in case they get um, injured in the workplace? And they want safety regulations so that they aren't injured in the workplace. And how do they get these things? Their primary aim is collective bargaining. By uniting together and presenting a unified front to the capitalists to make their demands. Together, they are strong. One man standing against the, the, the industrialist is weak. Now... They will use the strike, they will use the walkout, they will use the shutout. They will shut down production and try to hit the man where it hurts in the pocketbook in order to get notice. And they're counting on the fact that the, uh, the, the industrialists won't call the police out or something and fire them all and toss them out because then he'd have to hire all new people and he would be uh, perhaps in a worse place. Now, most labor unions in the progressive era are not socialists. Most labor unions today are not socialists. What they want is to reform capitalism. They want to, uh, the way they would see it, they want an equal voice in the productive process. They don't just want to be working for the man his whole life. They want to be a partner with the man. 
The group that we're going to take a closer look at is called the Industrial Workers of the World. This is an international organization. They exist not just in the United States, but all over the planet. They're called the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the IWW, and they're also known as the Wobblies. Where the Wobblies comes from, I have no idea. Historians have been, de been debating the origin of the term the Wobblies for some time. But they form in 1905 under a guy named Big Bill Haywood. Now their manifesto of 1905 reads like this. Fellow workers, this is the Continental Congress of the working class. I like that historical allusion there. We are here to confederate the workers of this country into a working class movement that shall have for its purpose the emancipation of the working class from the slave bondage of capitalism. The aims and objects of this organization shall be to put the working class in possession of the economic power, the means of life, in control of the machinery of production and distribution without regard to the capitalist masters. So this IWW manifesto is pretty clear. What do they want? They want socialism. They want the worker in charge of the means of production. And they don't care about the capitalist. One of their posters says, join the IWW. This one's from Madison, Wisconsin. Abolish the wage system. That essentially means abolish capitalism. Another one of their posters is a big, strong, brawny looking guy right there. It says, IWW, I will win. The IWW, the Wobblies, aim to unite the working class into one union to promote labor's interests. It worked to organize unskilled and foreign-born laborers and, yes, note this, guys, they advocated social revolution, just as Karl Marx did, and they led major strikes. They stressed solidarity of the working man. Strikes, says an IWW pamphlet, are mere incidents in the class war. They are tests of strength, periodical drills in the course of which the workers train themselves for concerted action. This training is mostly is most necessary to prepare the masses for the final catastrophe, what they believe is the inevitable consequences of history, the general strike which will complete the expropriation of employers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how labor radicalized during the progressive era.